All right, you guys, we are back with another episode of Hope Ignited. So excited to be in the studio today. Getting back to our sports roots, I know one of our favorite sports that we don't get to chat that much about. Kevin, help me welcome to the studio, Garrett Smithley. All right, Garrett. Love it. Look at the shirt. He's like a walking billboard. Game pink. I was prepared. I was prepared. I'm just glad that I could find it. I, I was there you lucky go. that laundry day was before my last race. We got to so. get you a few more. You know, yes. you have a couple spares laying around. Yeah. 100%. Story I'm, no, I'm uh, excited to be here with you guys. Yeah. Well, you know, um, a lot of people, Garrett, have had an opportunity to see the pink car on the track. But for those of you that aren't as familiar, I do want to intro Garrett. So Garrett's competing for Rick Ware Racing in the NASCAR Cup Series. He previously spent four full-time season competing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And we can break that down. I mean, I think it's going to be really cool to educate our audience on NASCAR, but basically Xfinity and then Cup. And you just have this unique opportunity to kind of do both, right, Garrett? You're kind of dipping into both of those yeah yeah my uh my career and i'm you know i'm sure we'll get into it but my career has been very different coming up than a lot of guys that i'm racing with i started very late started at 15 which is a late start mm. as a as a, a driver uh and especially to get to the nascar level so um it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun i've got something like 200 and 50, 60 something starts in NASCAR. Um, don't quote me on that number, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, the, the pink car that we got to run, well, we, we ran, ran it last year at Daytona in August and then ran it this year at Atlanta in July. And it is one of the most popular cars that, that I drive mm -hmm. and the suit bright pink. I always yeah. kind of make a joke. Hey, you got to wear sunglasses cause the pink is so bright, but, yeah. uh, uh, people say I look good in pink, so I'll take it. There you go. You do, you do. And I'll tell you one of my favorite things, and I'm glad that you mentioned that you did those months at those tracks, is that when when we all started kind of dreaming this up with True Brand, you were a huge advocate of like, let's not do October, right? Like I think mm -hmm. if we're going to have an impact, especially on the sport and for the women and families that you guys serve, let's do it outside of just a normal month and let's make people think about it every day of the year, not just during the month of October. So I just wanted to start off by saying thank you from the bottom of our heart for being such an advocate of our mission. Um, you're always available to us. I just can't say thank you enough because you're a big deal, Garrett. Like you, like <laughs> you, I know your humility, like I know you will not say that, but it really does make a huge difference when somebody like you with a talent like you have takes the time. It's bigger than a pink suit. It's bigger than the car, right? Like you really have a lasting impact on our mission. So thank you for that. We appreciate well, it. I, I appreciate you saying that. And, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have a, a partner like True Brand who's been with me for years to allow us to to do this with you guys. I know that they've been big supporters of, uh, you know, National Breast Cancer Foundation. And um, to your point, going to Talladega and watching the Xfinity race and seeing all these different pink cars in October, um, it, it kind of gets a little satur oversaturated and, and, you know, breast cancer is not an October thing. It mm -hmm. is a, you know, every single day, 365 uh, days a year. And, you know, these families and, and these women are, you know, they have to deal with that all year, all year long. And, and we should talk about it more than just October. So um, they've been giving me the opportunity to, to talk about it. And uh, obviously, working with you guys, and uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, getting it out there and, and getting the feedback from, from people, you know, there's, there's very important women in, in my life. And, um, you know, fortunately in my immediate family, I haven't been affected by it, but you know, our family has been affected by mm -hmm. it, uh, family, friends. And, um, one in particular, uh, my, uh, one of my best friends in elementary school, um, his mom, uh, battled and beat it. And, uh, we've had her out to the racetrack before, um, she's a great family friend of ours. So, uh, something that needs to be talked about. Yeah. Um, we talk about, you know, going and getting screened, you know, anything that I can do to, to push that along. Um, you know, I'm happy to do. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, we got to go back and hear, this is a dream. You're living a dream. I know at times it doesn't feel that way probably, but you're living a dream that, you know, pretty much every guy and a lot of girls, uh, have, which is 
to be a professional race car driver. I can't think of anything cool. You walk into a bar or something like that. What do you do for them? Well, you know, I drive NASCAR. You know. I mean, that's the coolest thing. It just shuts the party down, right? But how did you get into this world? Yeah, so my dad was, uh, was a huge fan. Um, he actually went to school. He's a pilot. Um, I personally think he has a cooler job than I do. He's a, a fire bomber um, oh. out in uh, California. He, he flies all the California fires in a, a big old DC-10. He basically takes this big airliner and flies it like a fighter jet to, to put out fires and oh, save lives Low out there. Passes. So um, yeah. Going back to it, he went to college at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University right behind Daytona, and he grew up going to the NASCAR races and the uh, 24 hours of Daytona races. So when I came along, I remember watching NASCAR, you know, two, three, four years old, knowing all the drivers, all the crew chiefs, all the sponsors, and just being so obsessed with racing. And um, didn't really get into it as a driver, didn't really think that it was even possible until we moved. I, I was born in Pennsylvania. Uh, we lived in Northern Virginia for a little bit and then uh, eventually got to Georgia and racing is a little bit more mainstream down in the Southeast. So we started going to some local races and there was a sign at this particular track that said test drive a race car. And I believe I was 14 or 15 at the time. And I was like, man, I, I got to figure out a way to do that. Cause I was always obsessed with it. I played with matchbox cars uh, drove on online and, mm -hmm. and on video games and things like that. And, um, finally found this local racing series, went to test and loved it and did the research. And we found a, a car that was, uh, affordable enough for us to go race. And, uh, off we went to the races, uh, not knowing what or, or what we were doing or where wow. we were going with it. It's, uh, it's completely it's, outsiders at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. My dad didn't race. Um, I had some some family members. I had a great uncle that raced. I had a, a grandfather that raced. Um, just very, very mm -hmm. locally, very amateur. But I didn't know any of that until probably two or three years into my racing career. And then all of a sudden, my parents were like, well, yeah, racing is a little bit in your background. But as far as our family goes, I'm a first-generation racer. We didn't know a spring from a shock. Uh, we didn't know how to put tires on. Like it was like, we had to completely learn this deal. So, um, to, to be where I'm at, like, like you said, it is, I have to pinch myself sometimes cause I am quite literally living a dream and, uh, been very fortunate, very grateful to, to be where I'm at. Along the, along that path from when you were 15 years old to where you are now, I'm sure there were some moments where you maybe thought about quitting or you encountered tremendous adversity, what did you do to yeah. overcome that? After the third lap of my career, I uh, I hit the wall. Third third mm. lap ever in the in the car. Um, I was like, well, I might have bitten off more than I could chew here. <laughs> um, no, but uh, yeah, it's 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 such a, a difficult industry. It's funny because I told my dad, uh, and actually, we just had a, a conversation about this the other day. I told my dad when I was 10 or 11 years old, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a pilot just like you. And he said, no, you're not. The industry is too risky and there's not enough job opportunities. And, you know, I want more for you. You need to go do something else. And I was like, well, I guess that's that's that. And uh, then I picked something that was even, yeah, even so more risky. You didn't become like an insurance agent or something. You decided to go do something, a level jump up from yeah. your dad. Yeah, but no, when when I found the passion for it, you know, I, I I grown up doing, you know, that was one thing that my parents always very instrumental in both me and my brother. I have a brother who's two years younger. Um, they always put us in different things. Uh we were Boy Scouts, uh loved playing baseball, T ball, um, you know, coach pitch, all that stuff, uh, played a little bit of basketball. Um, did theater, we were, we danced, we, I was in chorus. I've been singing since I was, uh, very, very young. So we got to do a lot of different things growing up and they made sure that we kind of were exposed to, to, to everything and, and, and everything. Um, but, uh, once I got in the race car, it was like, that, that was it. I said, okay, well, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it was like a, a switch flipped. And from that point forward, I, I wasn't super motivated in school. Uh, I wasn't very good at school. Um, my brother got the brains uh, of the two of us. But uh, once I found racing, it was everything that uh, that I wanted. And, um, and I had a passion for it and, and worked hard at it. So special. I think a lot of people listening, maybe, you know, 
think they know about NASCAR. Maybe they're fans of the sport, but they don't. Like, let's talk about how hard it is to make it. I feel like the really cool thing about the age that we live in is you've got all these documentaries. So like everybody's an F1 expert now, right? Yeah. Like in, in the NASCAR documentary, like I know that's, that's coming, right? So it'll be great for people to really get to learn the sport, but educate people that maybe don't know. It's a big deal when you make it to Xfinity, much less cup, right? Like, let's talk about it. Yeah. I, I think, um, the thing about racing that people don't really realize as opposed to other sports is there's always a path in other sports, right? Like if you want to go play in the NFL, you, you play, you play flag football, then you play in, you know, middle school and then you play in high school and then hopefully you get a scholarship and you go play for a college and you get drafted. Um, baseball, the same thing you play, uh, you play T-ball, you play coach pitch, you play in, in high school, you play in college, um, you know, single A, double A, triple A, all, all, all the way up to the MLB. Um, and that's pretty much how it is for most, most all sports in racing. There's no set path. There's so many different racing series out there. There's dirt racing, there's asphalt racing. Um, there's road course racing, there's go-karts there. There's all kinds of different avenues in motorsports. And there's no set path that, that, you know, you look at every single person, you know, 36 to 40 drivers that are on the grid every Sunday and every single one of their paths are different oh, no matter you know if they came from you know a big name in the sport like chase elliott or ryan blaney um or if uh you're like a ross chastain who was a watermelon farmer um or myself <laughs> who was a first generation racer like there's no set path so um that's the first thing the second thing is that just for what it is racing is expensive it's expensive to yeah. put race cars on the racetrack um, no matter if you're running Bandoleras, which is what I started in, it's like a go-kart with a body, all the way up to the Cup Series. It's expensive. Tires, the motors, the the actual car, the equipment, the cost to wreck, um, you know, all of those different things, the travel, it's so expensive. And so if you don't come from a family that has, you know, that's independently wealthy that can kind of pay your way, so to speak, you have to go and find sponsors and you have to figure out a way to continue racing and continue your dream. So, um, you know, to that point, my parents basically helped me, you know, they bought me my first race car. And then soon after that, they said, this is pretty much the level that we can afford. If you want to go past this, you got to figure this out on your, uh, on your own. So, um, I, never thought that I would be interested in business or sponsorship or marketing or return on investment or business to business, like all of these different terms. I just wanted to get in the race car and go fast. Right. But I quickly found out that if I was going to be successful in this business, I needed to learn about sponsors and marketing and, and how I can use my platform to help them succeed in their business. So uh, I was fortunate to find a, a local sponsor as a golf cart shop and we approached them to help us out with some paint and some welding and some parts and pieces here and there. And the relationship grew into the point where they bought my, my next race car, the next level to go up with, which was a legend car, which we couldn't afford. And all the way through my career, I've found these different sponsors and different partners and, and created these relationships to where it got me further and further and further to the point where I was a solid fixture in the Xfinity series and, you know, I had a job for the next four years and really didn't bring the sponsorship that I, that I needed um, just because I had a little bit. And then I was able to, in my career, take care of my equipment, do what my car owner wanted me to do and um, show these, these owners that, Hey, you know, Garrett is good enough to where, you know, he can take care of my equipment, but also drive the car, um, you know, to the level that it, it can be driven. And, um, you know, it's very relationship driven. It's very sponsorship driven. Um, but it's, I, I don't know the odds, but I'm pretty certain that becoming a, a race car driver, becoming an NASCAR driver, uh, you probably have a better chance of hitting the lottery. And that's mm -hmm. in any, uh, that's in any, any sport, um, football, basketball, baseball, whatever. Um, the thing about NASCAR is when you go and tune in on Sundays, there's 36 to 40 drivers. And that's it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You go to a football game. It's not even a full football team. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. And so um, that's the that's the one thing that kind of sticks out to me. I don't know exactly the stats, but somebody sent it to me that there's only been like 2,500 people ever in the history of of NASCAR that's ever started a, a NASCAR Cup race on Sunday. Mm. So wow. the fact that I've gotten, I think I'm at 75 Cup starts and 200 something Xfinity starts, it's it's incredible. I, like I said, I gotta pinch myself sometimes, and you know when, when I start talking about it too much, it's it's easy to get emotional because it is it's a dream, 100. Mm. percent Garrett, uh, what does a week of preparation look like and the day of the race day? Kind of take us through that. Yeah, that's a a great question. Um, Probably different than most people would think. So for me, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so I I actually raced this past weekend at uh, Las Vegas on on the Saturday race. So And then I stayed for the cup race. So um, got back home, probably hit the pillow around 2.30, 3 o'clock. Uh, I was up around 8.30, um, started with some phone calls and, you know, had some things that I needed to take care of. Um, (laughs) You know, when you're on the road, say 38 weeks, you know, 36, 38 weeks out of the year, you still have to figure out a way to to make sure your your home is still, uh, you know, you still got to do laundry and you still got to do all the the normal stuff. Yeah. You uh, you don't have maids and all that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, I I know. Yeah. You're still a guy. (laughs) I got my apartment here in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina that, uh, that somehow, you know, is still standing when when I come back. (laughs) But, um, so, you know, taking care of all that stuff. And then if we have sponsors, um, you know, normally I'll schedule some phone calls throughout the week to do debriefs of, you know, how the race went, how the weekend went, um, I'll go to the race shop uh, once or twice a week. So at, at some point I'll go over there probably tomorrow. I'll go to the race shop and, and talk to the guys and kind of debrief with them, talk to my crew chief, kind of do a, um, you know, just a debrief of how the weekend went, um, what we could have done better, what what we did well, things like that. Um, you know, a little bit of working out, uh, a lot of cardio, a lot of heat training, things like that. A um, little bit of weightlifting. Um that's, those are all things that I can improve on because I hate doing that, but I know it's a necessity um, for racing. And then, uh, and then fast forward to the race weekend. So let's just say I'm racing on Sunday. So we'll usually leave probably on a Friday, uh, Friday afternoon, and then uh, get to the hotel. And then Saturday we practice qualifying and then uh, Sunday race. So um, a typical Sunday is – uh, wake up, uh, let's just say it's a three o'clock start. So wake up, uh, probably around, you know, nine, 10, um, get to the racetrack, try to get to the racetrack, uh, you know, at least two hours, two and a half hours before, just depending on obligations. Sometimes if we've got appearances or, uh, interviews, I'll get there a little bit earlier and then, uh, we'll have, um, a driver's meeting and then, um, driver intros. I'll somewhere in there, probably about an hour beforehand. I'll try to eat something small. I very much struggle to eat on race days just because you got the butterflies and you're anxious to get going. So I force myself to eat. Um, Those races are long. They could take three and a half, four hours. Um, All the while, the whole week I'm hydrating. So if I'm not hydrated by that Sunday, then it's too late. So uh, I'll start, you know, probably, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on how hot it's going to be. And then, um, I'll do water Gatorade, uh, together, uh, and then, um, and then driver intros, do pictures at the car and then hop in and, uh, off to the races. I, uh, the question that everybody really wants to know, Garrett, and I hope you know where I'm going with this. You're in that car for three and a half, four hours. You've burnt 200 million calories. What happens when you have to pee? What do you do? Yeah. The, the most requested question that I ever get <laughs> from five-year-olds and me. <laughs> so yeah, hundred percent. So it's one of two things. Either you go, or you don't, and that's it. Mm. Oh, <laughs> there's, no, there's no in between. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I have gotten my hydration. I have learned my body. I've learned what I need out of hydration. So, um, you know, over hydration is a thing. And I did that my very first truck series race. Um, you talked about the different levels. So the cup series, the Xfinity series, and then the truck series, um, Xfinity series and truck series is kind of like minor leagues. So, um, 
So I have over hydrated. Fortunately, I've never had to go in the, in my suit. Uh, in you my better seat, knock on but, wood uh, right uh -oh. now. You better knock. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, that and uh, if you do have to go, then you better be in the shop Monday morning to take your feet <laughs> and put it out. You'll never hear the end of it from the guys, yeah, right? Your interior guy yeah. is not going to be happy at yeah. all. Yeah. That's so. too funny. When you talk about the travel and you talk about the team, what is the camaraderie like with the pit crew? Do you get to know those guys pretty well? I heard you mention your, your crew chief, but I'm so curious about the pit crew. Yeah, so our road crew – the guys that are in the shop every single week, they're the guys that you really get to know. They're the guys that you travel with. The pit crew, honestly, over the last few years, there's been some years that we've had the same pit crew throughout, and I have made some really good friends with – I've got some super, super close friends that are, that are on some pit crews. Um, but for the large majority of my career – what happens is that we go to bigger teams or we go to, you know, a, a pit school. Um, basically it's a, it's a organization that goes and recruits pit crews and then they train and then the race teams, they will basically rent pit crews. They'll pay mm -hmm. to have, you know, an A, B or C pit crew. So, um, so for, for the most part, especially as of late, we have guys that come in and it's all different pit crews and I don't really get a chance to, to get to know those guys. I'll talk to them a little bit before the race. I'll give them fist bumps, you know, say, hey, guys, stay safe out there. You know, is there anything that you want me to know? Um, you know, some tracks have smaller pit boxes. Sometimes you got to pit a little, you know, deeper in the box or a little further away from the wall or a little closer to the wall, just depending on, you know, what your pit crew wants. Um, so we'll have some of those conversations. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk after the race. But uh, for the most part, I don't really have a chance to get to know them simply because it's always different. We always mm -hmm. have different pickers. So you kind of can't get that rhythm. Bigger teams, they'll have, you know, I'm with a smaller team, Rick, we're racing. So, um, we've got pit crews, different pit crews every week. Um, but then, um, you know, bigger teams, they'll have the same pit crew all year long. So that's definitely something that I'm hoping, you know, if I can get back full time that I can get back in the swing of that and getting to know those guys, because, um, those guys are taking care of you. Those guys mm -hmm. are, you know, <laughs> hopefully putting your, putting your tires on safe and making sure that no lug nuts are loose and, um, you know, faster the stop, the, the better you are on track. Yeah. That's who I want on my side is my pit crew. That's for 100%. sure. That's and right. those guys are a hundred percent athletes. I know we oh, you know, yeah. always a big debate about NASCAR drivers and, and being athletes, and I'm not even going to have that debate with anybody. But um, one thing that that gets missed a lot is those pit crews are 100 they hustle. percent athletes. They work out. I mean, every single day, and then they do pit practice. So yeah. it's. I mean, they're 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 D1 college athletes that are you know guys that aren't going to go to the NFL, guys that aren't aren't going to go to the MLB, and they are heavily recruited by these race teams and. Um, they make good money <laughs> and they should. <laughs> yeah. They're slinging those, those wheels over the barriers and like just the speed that they move and precision. I mean, it's tenths of a second makes a huge difference for you guys. Well, and not, not only that, if you go to a mile and a half track, we're going 50 miles an hour, you know, 45 to 50 miles an hour, uh, down the pit road, you stand by any road and you watch a car go by at 50 That's miles fast. an hour. Yeah. It's cooking. Yeah. And these guys run right out, in front of of our cars going 50 miles an hour it's insane well changing gears a second you've got that game pink shirt on uh just as a reminder for uh some of the audience the hope ignited audience game pink is an initiative that NBC have started to really dig into the streaming community and to get out there and gaming which is huge i'm sure kids have probably run across this at some mm -hmm. point we're doing all kinds of fun stuff. But one of the really fascinating developments in the last few years is eNASCAR and virtual uh, driving, essentially. Uh, can you tell us about what you do in that? I think this is so, so cool what you're doing. Yeah, so it started back uh, beginning of 2020. Obviously, we all know uh, that was the COVID year. So for about eight to 10 weeks, NASCAR was completely shut down as was all other professional sports. Mm -hmm. So we had this unique opportunity to bring these 
online virtual races to the public because of a, a software called iRacing. And it's basically a simulator. It's the best simulator on the market, in my opinion. Um, very realistic the way, you know, I, I have a, a wheel that I use, a virtual, uh, a real wheel, but, you know, in virtual racing, um, you have a wheel and pedals and a shifter, and, and it's very realistic how, how iRacing works. So um, NASCAR partnered with uh, Fox, who is one of our broadcast partners, and um, we all the, the NASCAR Cup Series drivers and some of the Xfinity Series drivers, we put on these virtual races that were televised. And I believe it was the second or third race that we did, um, you know, televised on Fox Sports 1 that broke the record for a, a live eSports event on TV. Oh. I think we had like 1.3 million people there watching. Incredible. And of course, there was nothing going on. So, um, you know, all the media p- picked it up. Um, I fortunately have been very good at iRacing. I've done it for a long time. So I won the pole for the very first one. Oh, no kidding. Um, ended up finishing fifth. Denny Hamlin won, but I was racing with Denny Hamlin and Dale Jr. and Jimmy Johnson, Kyle Busch, you know, all the superstars of our sport. And all of a sudden, we were on an even platform. We, you know, <laughs> we were all in the same car. It didn't matter what motor you had. didn't matter yeah. how, many, how many tires you had. didn't matter what kind of equipment, who was working on your car. Just a one-to-one had, gauge of yeah. talent, really. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And the, the real, I mean, there's no substitute for, for real racing. I'm not taking anything away from that, but it was cool to be on that platform and, and to go and compete against those guys. I ran in the top fifth. I, I didn't end up winning any of them. I finished third, I think was my first one, but I ran in the top five every single week. And I started getting a lot of messages from some of my competitors that I never would have dreamed would have reached out. And I think that they gained a lot of respect for mm-hmm. what some of, some of us in the cup series that, you know, don't get a chance to shine, um, just because of our equipment. Um, I think that there was a lot of, you know, camaraderie and there's Uh a lot of respect that was given. So, um, that was really cool. The other cool thing that I got to do or that I started doing with that is that I started, uh, live streaming. So on Twitch, I started, uh, streaming everything that I was doing. So I'd have my camera, um, I would, uh, broadcast basically everything that I saw on my screen, um, and then I would have a camera on me. So it would kind of take that and, and show people like what my, um, seat looked like going mm-hmm. into these races. And it became such a, such a really, really cool experience because it was a way for me to really intimately connect with my fans because we had chat going and, you know, they could talk directly to me. Um, I think my first stream, I had like 4,000 or 5,000 people tune in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then past that, we had, a, you know, a couple thousand, you know, hundreds, 200, 300 people. Um, I created Discord, uh, which is kind of like a, a social media platform, voice social media platform that we had over 500 people that were supporters um, that really built a community around just me, you know, watching me play video games, watching me do virtual races. So that was a really cool experience and honestly helped our sponsors. I, I, I found new partners and new sponsors from it. Um, and it's been a lot of fun, obviously since then going back real racing, um, I haven't had as much time to do that. Um, but I still, I'll still stream. Uh, we have a, a league called Monday Night Race League that a lot of people in the industry go and do. Um, so starting the Monday after the last NASCAR race, which I believe is the sixth, so I think the seventh, we come back and, and start doing league races again. So I'm going to start doing mm-hmm. some more streaming every Monday there um, on Twitch. Um, but it's just it's such a fun community. It's such a fun atmosphere. Um, you know, I talked about doing chorus, I would, I'll do some karaoke, I'll sing, I'll, you know, do goofy things. It's just a way for, for me kind of to, to be myself away from the racetrack and, Mm. and give, give my fans and, um, and, you know, people that, you know, want to know kind of the behind the scenes stuff, um, you know, who I am and an opportunity to come and be interactive. 
I love that so much. Well, speaking of fans, you know, we're your biggest fan and I love that you just, you know, you'll wear that shirt every, every time you do eNASCAR. That sounds great. (laughs) Um, But Garrett, we could, we really could spend all day here with you and I know how precious your time is. We just heard your weekly breakdown, right? Of your commitments. And it sounds like you better start chugging some water and Gatorade um, here shortly, but Um, I just want to say again, thank you so much. You know, we have to mention True Brand. They really kind of brought us together and allowed us the opportunity, afforded us the opportunity, quite literally, to turn the car pink and the suit pink. And, you know, one of the things that I've appreciated so much about you is that you you do push them further, right? Like, let's do a pink suit. Let's, Let's do this. Let's do that. I loved one of my very favorite things was we decided we were going to do an Instagram live with you. And you said, what if we did the car reveal? Like, what if we did that live? And it was your raw emotion. And we got to all be together for that moment. Like you, you're willing to push the boundaries to widen the platform, to allow us to further our mission. And I can never say thank you enough for that. So many women and families are going to be impacted because of your heart and whether you're flying a plane whether you're doing e-racing, whether you're behind that wheel, truck series, cup series, Xfinity, whatever it is. Or singing karaoke. Or singing karaoke. We will always be your biggest fan. And from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for everything you do for NBCF. Uh, well, th- thank th- thank you all. It's been uh, it's been a fun journey with y'all, and I hope we can continue it. Um, like you said, you know, got to give a shout out to True Brand for making it all possible. Um, and uh, again, it's it's just it's the least I can do for for uh, for NBCF and um, and the women. There's so many important women in all of our lives. So I want to say to you guys, go get screened. It's very yeah. important. Yeah. We want we want you around for a long time in our lives. Right. So go get screened. Right. Well said. Uh, it's uh yeah it's uh just a blessing to, to work with you guys and hopefully we do it for a long time well thank you so much garrett we love 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 you you give us hope and you give all the women and families that we serve hope so from the bottom of our hearts again thank you so much and to everybody watching and listening we look forward to seeing you guys back here at the hope ignited table for our next episode see you again soon